What is going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. Uh, in today's channel we are going to be continuing the build on the O2R1. Now you know if you watched the last episode that we just ripped out the engine. Uh, now it is time to go over that engine and determine what is good and what's bad. Now we do know that the transmission has the faulty second gear that everybody unluckily has. So we're going to have to fix that. However, to fix that the engine has to be split right here. Now, to split the engine right there, we can't just pop off the oil pan. We have to take off from here down. And to do that, that means we have to take off uh, our clutch covers, our stator cover, our timing cover, our timing chain. And in order to do the timing chain, we have to take off the valve cover and remove all that. So, basically the whole motor pretty much has to be torn down. Um, like I said, you know it is a higher mileage engine. It does have some carbon buildup in your typical wear. It does run really good though. It doesn't smoke and it doesn't use oil, which is good news. So I don't know if we'll have to touch the pistons or rings. Uh, again, we don't want to go crazy with the build, um, but if it has to be done, we'll do it. Now, the way we're going to test out and figure out if we have to do the piston rings is by doing a compression test. The way we do that is we pull out all the coils and all the plugs and individually we'll test each cylinder with a compression tester, turning it over with this battery and the power wire that goes directly to the starter. I have currently a uh, pair of vice grips holding the throttle wide open so the engine can get maximum uh, turnover. And I think what we're shooting for is at least 190 in all cylinders. Now you don't want any difference between one cylinder or the next to be any more than 10% difference. For example, if one cylinder is 190 and one is 165, that's too much of a difference. Now if one's 190 and one's 196, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I think a new engine is somewhere around 205 PSI on these. If I read correctly, that's like 99 to like 2003, I believe. Um, so what we're gonna do right now, like I said, I'm gonna pull out the coils and the plug wires. I'm sorry, the plugs. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and test the compression and see where we're at and see if we need to mess with these pistons at all. All right, guys, so here's our spark plugs we just pulled. Uh, as you can see, if you can see, they look terrible. Uh, so we're going to replace those, obviously. They're only like 20 or 25 bucks. They're pretty cheap. Uh, and now we're ready and set up to do our compression tests. We are going to start with uh, cylinder number, I don't know if it's four or one, but whatever. We'll just say that that's number four. Um, we got our power hooked up, and all I got to do is connect my uh, power lead from the starter to the power, and let's see what happens when we touch it. Keep in mind, we don't have oil in this engine, so we're not going to turn it over too much. Uh, just, as, just enough to get our reading. And if we look at this reading here, uh, our first cylinder is reading 190, 200, just over 200. So that's good compression. We probably don't have to touch nothing there so far. Let's go ahead and test 234, and I'll show you what the numbers are. Cylinder number three looks like it's at two, about the same, about 200. Cylinder number two, about 196. All right, and for the final cylinder, cylinder number one is right at 200 as well. So from what I can tell, our compression is almost perfect. Uh, I'm not even going to touch the pistons. I'm going to leave them where they're at. And this is a uh, testimony to Yamaha's engines to show you how long-lasting with a higher mileage engine what these bikes can do and how well they're built. I mean, this thing runs at, you know, the teen RPMs. Uh, and here it is, you know, almost 20 years later, bike's been ridden hard and put away wet and it, it's still in great condition. So anyhow, good news for us. We're going to move forward from here. Uh, now that we have this done, we need to go ahead and start removing some of the panels. We have to take the valve cover off. Before we do anything, we're going to check valve clearance because that's going to be our next job. Uh, to do that, though, we'll have to take off the cooling accessories right here. No big deal. We'll get those off, check out our valve clearance, and see where we move from there. Alrighty, so uh, we went ahead and pulled off the coolant pipes. All you got to do, uh, you have two, well, it's not really T30, they're actually Allen heads. I didn't have my Allen head bit, but two uh, Allen heads here. Pull straight up or straight back towards you the way we're looking right now. Just kind of wiggle on them. You have to yank them. They'll come loose. Pull those back. I pulled out the same size six uh, bolts that hold in the valve cover here, and we're going to kind of break this thing free here now. I may have to have two hands to do this because it's been sealed on there for many years. I do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go set the, the camera down. I'll be right back. I'm going to go ahead and break these free. All right, guys. So simple enough, uh, take a soft mallet. Just tap around it real lightly. It's really easy to get off. Uh, and then obviously your gas is going to want to stick to one side or another. You want to kind of, I like to keep them with the valve cover uh, if you can. Both, all four are tabs there and then we'll just kind of lift that off. And uh, Well, here we go. 
So there is our cylinder heads, and uh, they look fairly clean. So if we're just kind of checking things out, um, and we're looking at the lobes here, um, this is kind of what you're looking for wear. So you really want to get yourself a nice paper towel, which I don't happen to have in my hands. Um, and inspect, wipe it off and inspect to see if you have any, any odd wear along these lobes here. Uh, that's going to tell um, the condition of your camshafts. Um, but like you saw in the last video for the R6, I won't drag you through all this, uh, but we're going to use test peeler gauges to uh, get these things at top dead center uh, and see what the uh, actual readings are and how much gap we have between uh, our cams and our uh, valve buckets. Now, all you really have to do for each cylinder, you're going to get, I should say each valve, is get this pointing up at 12 degrees, assuming it's you're at 12 degrees dead center up. Uh, and then you're going to slide your feeler gauge underneath it uh, and test that. So we're going to go ahead and do that, get our numbers, uh, and be right back. All right, guys, so to reiterate everything, I'm not going to go every detail on this since we did it on the R6 build, but again, I'm going to show you how we do do it. <clears throat> First thing you're going to do, you are going to take your cover, uh, which is right here, off the side of your timing uh, using either a, like a quarter or like a spark plug gap tool. Just spin it out, and you'll have access to the 14 millimeter nut. With the 14 millimeter nut that's going to spin your crank and again you're going to try to get each individual valve to sit straight up just like you see this one right here um, and we're going to start on the intake side which is the side with all the carbs or the throttle bodies whatever you want to call them we're going to start with one down here through eight and then on the exhaust side nine through 16. Uh, here's our clearances here so on the o2r1 intake clearance is between 0.11 and 0.20 uh, the larger being the better, the, as the engine, the valves wear, they get tighter. Uh, so the bigger the gap, the better, as long as it doesn't go above 0 0.20 millimeters. Same with exhaust. you got 0.21 to 0.27 millimeters. Uh, and these are the figures if you're doing the inch inches, so what met, or non-metric, SAE, or whatever it's called. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and write it down. Well, again, what we're going to use is our feeler gauges. So you'll see our highest and our lowest here, and there are a bunch that go in between. Uh, we have the closest I have to point, uh, one, one is a point one two, so that's good enough, I guess. And then a point two zero three at the top end. And all you're going to do is you're going to take your tool here and you're going to get underneath the valve and you're going to slide it down in between the valve and again that bucket, which is you can kind of see me touching right now. Um, when you slide that in, you pull it out. It should feel like there's about as if you were pulling this out of underneath, like a, like I'd say an encyclopedia, just enough to snag it. It's not hard, it's not loose, but it's just enough to snag it. Um, and again, you're going to run this from here down, and then you're going to switch to your intakes, and you're going to check from 0.21 to 0.27 along the top. Any differences? Uh, we are going to note the difference of what it actually is, and there's a calculator online that will tell you what size shim should be replaced. So let's go ahead and get our numbers real quick. All right, guys, so on to numbers. Just did all the valve checks. Uh, and here's the numbers that we got. Um, and, and really, these numbers, I, this, this, either this motor's been rebuilt before, it's not the original motor. There's no way it's as good as it is that has numbers that it has for having the mileage it had. So um, just to look at everything, everything is within spec except for a few on the intake side. I did realize this actually has 12 intake valves and only 8 exhausts, so a little bit different from the R6. Um, but just uh, intake number 1, 11, and 12, which should have been 1 here. And 11, 12 on the ends, which is pretty indicative of most engines as they wear, uh, are just slightly out of spec. So we might go through and just change those. Uh, the exhausts are almost all perfect. Like, they're, they're perfectly in the middle. Couldn't get any better. Um, but in looking at it, I was getting ready to pull the timing chain. Um, and I did notice something. If you look at this boat right there, this bike's been down before. At least this engine has. So not that that really matters, but, you know, things do tell you. Small, small clues tell you, you know, about the history of the bike. Uh, in fact, if you look at this bolt right here, if you can see that, it's got some wear on it. That means that, that bolt's been taken out before. So this is probably the original motor, but it's probably been gone through and rebuilt. You can also see new gasket material. So, you know, it's what it is. I don't know when it was rebuilt. Um, but the valve job is a pretty basic job that we are going to do since we are taking it apart. Uh, so what I'm going to do next to move forward, I need to get the timing chain off uh, before I do valves. Valves probably won't get done uh, until after we get the bottom end done uh, because I don't want to have to take all these bolts off and worry about everything falling all over the place. So to get the bottom end off though, we do need to take off, I believe, the timing uh, chain. 
So the retirement chain tensioner is right here, just uh, two simple eight millimeter bolts that pop out and the whole thing will pull out. However, I'd like to take out the timing chain cover since it's gotta come off anyhow, just to give a look inside to see how it looks and see if there's anything that we have to take out uh, necessary um, that I may not know of. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay guys, so I just took the two eight millimeter bolts out and just pulled out the tensioner real quick. Uh, pretty simple process. There's the gasket for it here. And there is the tensioner, uh, really straightforward. I then took the 14 millimeter nut with an impact, uh, lightly took it off counterclockwise. So this is going to slide out here for our lower timing gear. Uh, and then now this lower timing gear here has to come out. So I'm gonna go ahead uh, and I'm gonna pull this out. It's gonna be tough on camera. Uh, if possible, I'm gonna try to get this out so I can pull the chain off. That way I don't have to take off any of my upper gears, if I can. Um, if I can't, then I'll have no choice but to pull the upper gears. To do that, i got to pull everything off, which isn't a big deal if I'm just putting it back temporarily. But again, we don't want the buckets and any of the shims or anything to move inside there or fall out because then that whole test we just did with all the valve clearance was all for nothing. Um, and it's not fun to figure out where what goes where. So let me go ahead and see if I can get this out real quick. All right. All right. So I wasn't that lucky. Uh, I, went, I tried everything. I tried taking out the timing t chain tensioner. Um, slide and all that and I just nothing worked. So anyhow, I ended up just taking out the intake camshaft, which is okay because that's the valves that I have to attend to anyways. Um, so I went ahead and loosened that side up and pulled that out that you can see right there. Um, and there's the caps right there. And so what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to pull the pin out of this tensioner guide here. I'm going to move it out of the way if I can. Maybe slide it down as you see the chain drop. And uh, we're going to try to Again, see if I'm uh, lucky enough to be able to get this thing around it. I don't know if I can or not. I'm going to try, but uh, worst case scenario, when I do crack the case, this is going to drop a little bit, and it should clear the guide there, so I'm not really concerned about it. Um, and again, I'll temporarily put the, uh, um, the cam back in so the valve don't fall out or whatever, so we should be good there. But we have plenty of clearance, as you can see here. Um, and we're all right because the chain's being held up here on this other cam, so it's going to have to be retimed. But anyways, not really worried about that. Um, so let's go ahead and move forward from here. All right, so before we move to any more disassembly, uh, we're going to attend to these valves that we were messing with before. Uh, keep in mind, remember, it was 1, 11, and 12 that were giving us problems. So we're going to go ahead and take a magnet tool just like this, and we're going to pull off the first cap of the bucket, which if we look inside probably can't see that. Um, you'll see the little, it looks like a spacer. Um, that's going to have a tiny number, but there's no way in heck you're going to be able to see it. Um, but I'm going to get the number off that, and that number is going to determine what size that we put back inside there. Now the way it works is the thinner or the thicker it is, it makes up for that distance on how high this bucket sits as to uh, the actual camshaft itself, and that's where we get our clearances. So let me go ahead and do that, and then again we're going to move forward to disassembly. All right, guys, real quick, I just wanted to show you, since you can kind of see now, um, I got the buckets out. Again, the spacers just basically fall out of there, the shims fall out of there. If you can see, that actually says 94. This one says 92, and this one's worn off, so I'm going to have to take my mic and figure out what size that is. Uh, but basically, uh, this number here and whatever the clearance was will go into the calculator that's online, which I will also attach in this video so you guys can use it. Um, and it will tell us exactly what size shim we need to get to get our desired uh, gap. So let's go ahead and continue forward. I just wanted to show you that so you guys knew what I meant. Okay guys, so we are waiting on delivery for the valve shims, uh, and while we're waiting, I'm going to go ahead and I am going to block off the AIS system. Um, I was kind of doing some research here, and a lot of people pull these units out and then tap them into the head. The problem is you could basically ruin the head by doing that, so I don't know why people don't just tap these. They're really not in the way. They're not bothering me, so worst case scenario... They could still be hooked up if you ever wanted to hook them up, or if they break off, then you then you have the head obviously as a backup to tap. So I'm trying to tap these. That's kind of what I'm doing right now. Um, also, I was doing some research, and it looks like you may not have to take this top end apart to get that bottom end off. Um, I guess the timing chain is probably running to the crank, but it looks like where it splits, it doesn't need to be moved. So regardless, we do have to put this back together anyhow before we can tip that head back or upside down to get the bottom end off. Uh, but I think I'm going to go ahead and try to hook everything back up before I disassemble the bottom end just to see if I could do what everybody else was doing. Now the write-up I found was on a 99. I have to imagine that's somewhat similar. 
Um, I also noticed too that it's definitely been a rebuilt engine. If you look at the head, it's been painted black where the rest of the body, the paint on it is actually from when somebody painted the frame. Um, so you can see the indefinite separation of where it's been replaced, uh, which is probably the reason, again, it is in such good condition. So anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, uh, basically I'm drilling these out and I'm tapping these. I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, and then I got some small bolts that we're going to stick in place of them. So let me show you what that looks like when it's all done. All right, guys, so there it is. I'll finish the uh, AIS block offs. Um, a couple benefits, again, of doing this this way. Um, a lot of people will tap, take these out and tap into the block. Uh, you have the potential to really basically script the block if you used to do that. Um, <clears throat> also, by doing it this way, if I ever wanted to put this system back on, I could. Um, and the other side of that, too, is uh, I double lock this. So I put Loctite on it, which is, I don't even know where I got this Loctite, but this stuff's crazy. It does not come off. I mean, it's way better than lo red Loctite. It, whatever, but it works really well between the mix of that and the uh, the lock washers. This thing shouldn't come off, and the reason I say that, a lot of pe members uh, on some of the forums that I read were saying something about the bolts kept coming loose. So, that said, these things should not come out at all. Um, also, the second benefit is the aluminum is going to heat up a lot faster than the steel will, uh, so the heat shouldn't be as bad on these as it would be if it was directly inside the uh, block. Anyhow, uh, the, uh, the parts just came in for the head. Let's go ahead and take a look at those and uh, show you what we got to do with them. All right, guys, so the parts are in. Let me show you how it works. So if we look at the paper, we know, let's say, for valve number one, um, it, it called, when I put it into the uh, calculator, it called uh, from going from a 189 to a 180 valve shim. So we're going to go ahead and open the box. You can kind of see the numbers that are printed underneath the bottom. Right here is our 180 valve shim. So we're going to go ahead and pull that out, if I can get it out. All right. This is going to be tough to see like I showed you before, but somewhere on it, it is going to tell you, of course, it's not going to focus. It'll, it'll say that it's 180. Nonetheless, that is a 180. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use bare hands, not any gloves. I don't want to drop it. I'm going to go ahead and stick it right inside, if I can get it in here. This one's a little bit deeper than the R6, a little harder to get to. We don't want to drop it. But you want to go ahead and get it till it clips just like that. Okay, see how it's sitting? Then we are going to take our same valve bucket, the one that we have taken out of that same spot, and we are going to place it back over top of it right here. Push it down. That's all we got to do. We're going to do the same thing to these last two here, and then I'm going to show you how we're going to put this top end back together. Give me a second. All right, guys, so once you have your buckets all back in place, um, again, I only had to do one side. Um, if you're doing all of them, if you have problems with the exhaust side, you'll have the side off as well. Um, for me, because I didn't have to take it off, I just had to loosen these so I can move the cam uh, around. Not a big deal, but let me show you kind of what we're going to do from here. So on reassembly, uh, let's just assume I never took this out. This was still on here, or this pin. I just put those back in, cranked them back down. Uh, we're going to go ahead and we are going to turn this lower wheel, if you can see here. There is a couple marks on this uh, scroll wheel. You got two back here, and you got one right here. All right, so this line needs to mark up exactly with where the case splits right here. Can you see where that splits? So you want that line marked there, so it's already where it needs to be. The next move I take, because uh, it's easier, just go ahead and pull this valve guide right out. All you do is kind of stick a flathead screwdriver in here, pry it out a little bit, and this whole thing will come right out uh, and set it out of the way. Now, assuming that you have both cams out, what you want to do, you want to make sure that your cylinder one is at top dead center, which it should be if that marks where it's supposed to be. You should be able to stick like a screwdriver or whatever down into your um, cylinder and be able to feel it top off right at the top of the piston because it's all the way up. So that's top dead center. And then what we're going to do is if you can see this little arrow here, on the exhaust side, we are going to line up this tiny little hole that you have on the cam here on the exhaust side. And then on the intake side, there is a cam on the back plate which goes back here. And there will be a hole on that cam right there, if you can see that, that we're going to line up also uh, perpendicular, straight up and down, aligned, as you see, with those arrows. Once you get that done, we're going to slide that cam. Actually, you'll probably be sliding the cam underneath the chain before you get those set to however you want. We want to make sure that there's no tension, or no slack, I'm sorry, no slack in the back side of this chain. We want to keep it as tight as possible. And any tension that's going to be left over is going to be on this side. The reason why is our tensioner is going to go back in here, and that's where we want our slack to give. That way we know that when this thing is all lined up, all these marks are lined up, we're going to turn this thing three or four times in a complete circle just to make sure when we get back to where this thing is landing at top dead center that everything is still lined up and you're tightening 
or your uh, tensioner is tightened up. So uh, let me go ahead and let me set these things in here and show you what I'm talking about. All right, guys, again, to confirm, our single line mark is lined up with our case split. All right. Coming up here, our exhaust side cam bolt is lined up with the hole. Uh, the arrow is lined up with the hole. On the intake side, which you can't see right now, but it will look like this, our arrow is lined up with our small hole, if that makes sense. Now, all we got to do is go ahead and put the cam caps back on. And before that, after it doesn't really matter, you can take your valve guide, your chain, timing chain guide, sorry, and slide it right back down inside where it goes. It should land right there, as you see. Uh, go ahead and hand tighten these things equally uh, across each other. Every time you do the bolts, cross them from each other. Uh, you want this thing to sit flat down. You don't want side one, one side going down and the other trying to follow it because it will strip out. And uh, they do make a kit that the bolts are like a quarter inch longer if you do uh, basically screw one of the threadings up. Uh, but try to be careful. Don't use like an impact because you will destroy them. Do it by hand. Be careful. Be safe. Take your time. Uh, you won't have a problem. But again, all we're doing... Bottom, bottom line is lining that line up with that case split, our two little holes up with our two arrows on our camshafts, and then slowly bolting them down from the inside out, crossing each other, and getting it down to, I forget what the, the pound foot torque is. I don't know if the manual here tells me or not. I'm sure it does. Yeah, right here. 7.2 foot pounds. So uh, that's your, tor your torque settings for these uh, small bolts here. So let's go ahead and get this thing put back together and move forward. All right guys, so now it's time to install the timing chain tensioner. Uh, it's fairly simple. All you're gonna do is you're gonna take out the 10 millimeter uh, nut out the end of it, or bolt out of the end of it. Uh, you are gonna go ahead and set your gasket over top of it here. You are gonna sit both your bolts in so you're ready to go. Like so. You wanna look for the word up on here. It's kinda hard to see, but there's the word uh, up right there that faces upward you're going to want to take a small flat screwdriver like so you're going to stick it down here where there is a flat head insert as you push on the top and it should sink down just like so you are now going to hold your screwdriver in while you install this uh, as the second you take that screwdriver out this thing's going to shoot back up so you're gonna, I'm going to need two hands for this, but you're going to want to go ahead and stick this in and tighten your 8mm bolts down, let it go, and it'll tighten as it should. Now another thing I want to show you guys, you guys are going to notice that um, once you lock down these uh, caps, your uh, intake side is going to turn a little bit, just like that. And the reason why, you'll see there's a little bit of a gap, not a gap, but a kind of the chain hanging down right there. The second this tensioner goes in, it's going to tighten and pull that back. So don't worry, uh, like I am right now here, I tightened one side down in. I'm going to go ahead and pull the screwdriver out. You'll see that it popped back up and our timing mark is back to where it's supposed to be. So now all I have to do is put in the one under the screw right here, crank them down and it should be good to go. All right guys, once you've got your tensioner back in, what you need to do is you need to go ahead and you need to rotate uh, the uh, crankshaft here. Two full rotations to get your smart back on your dead center. Uh, I'm glad I did this because I thought I was perfect you'll notice they're both one tooth ahead so I need to go ahead and undo this and I can mark this on these sprockets here uh, so I know exactly where to put the sprockets back on the chain uh, but to move it back just one so I'm gonna go ahead and do that real quick all right guys there we go as you'll see it's good uh, remember that the book calls for turning it several times clockwise the crank here uh, to make sure that your timing chain tension or everything's tightened up and you're still in place where you're supposed to be um, the reason that that happened, mine was a tooth off, uh, was because I had too much tension, which I didn't even realize on this back side right here. Um, and it's easy to do, and one way to get around that is to, to spin this thing back a tooth. That way when you crank it down, it's already tight, and you're, basically what you're doing is you're putting uh, this mark where it's supposed to go, and then these dots, you want to stick these dots, one dot this way, or basically one tooth this way. That way when you crank this thing down clockwise to get rid of the slack, it brings it right back to where it's supposed to be. Anyhow, that's pretty simple there. Uh, we got that done. Now we're going to go ahead and throw on our valve cover, uh, and we're going to proceed to taking off the side cover so we can get this case off the bottom. All right, so we're going to start with the clutch cover first. Uh, you got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight 
uh, hex bolts that we got to take out. I went ahead and loosened them already. Uh, you'll have a couple areas that are down like in here where you can pry this back. I did suspect there'd be oil coming out of this, so just to be safe, I kind of just threw a uh, thing underneath it. Uh, though I do have it propped up a little bit, it shouldn't come out. So we drain the motor. And there's the clutch. Now, um, it's like somebody stripped out one of the bolts. Nice. Anyhow, um, there, there's other uh, things online that show how to get these clutch baskets off. Uh, for me, uh, what I read is basically taking these bolts out. We're going to take most of the basket out with all the plates. Uh, and from there on out, we should be able to see the starter gear, which should be back in here, and a few other things. So let's go ahead and see if we can get those out. All right, so continuing forward, I uh, pulled off the front half of the clutch uh, and released a small bolt right here. Um, I even pulled up the clutch packs and checked them out. They actually all look good. You can mic them to check them as far as thickness. Uh, but usually you can look at them and you can see you got plenty of pad left on those things. Uh, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my impact. I'm going to take off the main uh, nut here and I'm going to pull this whole basket out. All right, clutch basket off and there's the oil that we expected to be there. It's all good. We have a couple more uh, needle bearings to pull off here. Um, again, the whole basket is over there. I just set it out of the way. Uh, now I think, I believe the goal is to get this chain off right here. So that frees up our lower half of the block from our upper. And then we got to turn around and go to the other side and get out the stator and all that. That, I see a couple people using specialty tools. I also see you can use just a random bolt that screws into it that'll pry it back. So we'll, I don't have the tool, but we'll see if we can get it off. Let's go ahead and move to that side after we clean this oil out. All right, so for the stator generator side, we also got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight or nine, looks like nine bolts I got to come out. I just loosened them. So uh, doing this, I'm going to try to keep the gasket alive. I don't want to have to replace it. The other side literally just fell apart, um, probably because it's soaked in oil over there. Uh, oil can do damaging things to uh, gaskets. Uh, there is our uh, stator bracket there. I'm sorry, our stator cover or our rotor, they would call it, I believe. Um, so we have a bolt here to take off, what I believe is a 13 millimeter. Maybe, a, maybe actually it's a 14 millimeter, if I remember correctly. Um, and we're going to pull that thing off. Uh, and like I said, I, I might need a special tool to get this off, but I'm going to do what I can, and I'll let you know exactly how that happens. Okay, guys, so the rotor is off, uh, and actually it was fairly easy. Um, all I had to do was uh, use this, and uh, by this, don't think of anything special here. If you can get a bolt just with these threads, uh, that's all you need. I don't know what size thread that is. You'll have to uh, probably go to the store and figure it out. It's a fine thread metric. Um, but there's a tricky part to this, and what I wanted to show you is there's actually two different size threads. Uh, you have a larger one right in the face of it, and when you look all the way through it, there's a smaller one. Do not try to pull this off with the smaller one. That's your crankshaft. You will destroy your crankshaft. Um, so to give you an idea of the difference in size of the bolts, that's the smaller one, that's the larger one. Now all I had to do was literally just screw this in. Um, and you'll be able to see here, it's only about a quarter inch deep of threads and then it stops. And then that's where you see the face of the crankshaft. But you'll screw this in, you'll put your impact on it, a couple seconds, bam, it pops right off. And this is kind of the face of it here on which the bolt will stop. So uh, if you were to imagine this rotor being on there, uh, this is sitting right here. So it's really actually pretty easy to do. Uh, no special real tools needed, just get yourself a larger bolt that fits in those threads right there. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and take these three bolts out here. We're going to pull our generator off, and then we should be clear to start pulling off this top end. All right, with the three screws and the fourth little one holding the wire, the stator is completely removed. I uh, then went ahead and removed all the hex bolts all the way around the space cover here, and now it's ready to come off. If I can be careful and not destroy a gasket again would be great. Oh. And, of course, the gasket split. Why wouldn't it? That's okay. There's our pump. Uh, all good stuff. Good to see. Um, we'll have to replace these gaskets anyways. They probably need replaced rather than messing around with them. A uh, little gasket bushing just fell down there. I'll have to find that. Uh, so be careful of that. It literally just came out of right there um, and fell down here somewhere. So we want to find that. Anyhow, um, I guess at this point what I want to do is I'm still trying to get this uh, timing chain pump free here, which is over here. So I'm going to go ahead and get that thing freed up, and then I guess we'll move on to start splitting some of the larger bolts here and getting this case apart to see where we're at. So let's go ahead and move forward. All right, guys, so I got the chain out, and the way I did that, um, the last sprocket, or the lower sprocket, is held in by a 10 millimeter nut right here that is Loctited in. Uh, so what I had to do is I had to go ahead and grab a hold of the chain and the uh, sprocket like this, being careful not to hurt the teeth, obviously, just, just enough to snug it up. And then I went ahead and took a 10 millimeter uh, wrench 
it loosened it up and just popped the whole thing off. The whole thing came right out. So pretty much now we're free to go. The other option would have been having to take all the bolts off and pull the whole pump out. Uh, I didn't really want to have to do that. It wasn't that hard to get that bolt out. But what I have to do now, um, now the only thing that's connecting the upper block, other than obviously bolts, um, is this uh, this hose right here. So I need to disconnect this hose and loosen it up so it's free. Uh, and then I'm gonna have to pull out the outer case bolts, and you can see the inner case bolts. Uh, and that should free this whole thing up. That this thing should split off. Um, if if what I read online was correct, at least anyhow, uh, where you wouldn't have to actually take the top end off to get all this stuff off. Uh, and then we should see the transmission, which is down in there. So let's go ahead and see if I can get this thing off real quick. All right, guys, so I actually ended up having to take the oil pump out. And the reason why was actually because of these three bolts here, these 10 millimeters. Uh, the pump was over top of them. There's no way to get it out. So uh, I didn't film that, but to get the pump out, it was pretty straightforward. There's a few hex bolts. You'll be able to see them clear as day where they go. Uh, the upper pump or upper pipe here that goes to right there. This bolt undo undoes that. That just pulls out. Same with the one that's going into the side right here, which is actually connected to this tube right here. Uh, just a little hex bolt that pops out. And then I was able to just kind of wedge it from the side, the little turbo looking thing, out and slide it out. So there it was. Um, now I've got all the bolts all the way around it loose and all the ones inside it, except for just this one here, uh, right here. And the reason why I'm going to have to use a ratchet, because I don't want to take this big uh, cooler off. Uh, because I can already tell you how I, I didn't take off the oil filter I should have and man this thing was just full of oil I didn't think it still would be but it was so anyways the what it calls for right now is to take a mallet of some sort You don't want a metal hammer uh, once all the bolts are loose you Just go around and kind of tap it because apparently these two halves are uh, Silicone together so we're gonna go ahead and tap that free and I'm gonna pull this case straight back and we'll look at that transmission All right guys, so there is the lower half of the case um, You can actually see the rod bearings. It's kind of be hard to see for me to show you this but um, without the light I can't really show you but uh, they basically look brand new they are in excellent shape there's really no wear I'm just going to get a little bit of light on it if you can see that or not they're shiny smooth there's no real wear that I can see of at all whatsoever which tells me indefinitely this build wasn't done that long ago so good news is here's our transmission so also remember that little bushing we dropped is right there. We're about to get that out because, boy, you want to talk about something ruining your week. Uh, you forgot that in there, and you'd have some big trouble. So I'm going to go ahead in here and try to get this thing out, if I can, without getting everything else stuck to it. Ah, there it is. Sweet. Uh, but now it's time to inspect these gears, so I need to get everything pulled out. And we're going to look at the what they call the dogs, which are these little things right here. I'm sorry, no, those are the shift forks. These are the dogs right here um, that interlock into these uh, back of these gears, and that's what happens. The shift forks end up bending, uh, and these dogs don't get all the way locked into the other gear, and they end up kind of just shearing off each other and just wearing out. They round out, uh, and that's why when you're taking off in the second gear, it just kind of bloop and pops out. So uh, I won't know until I get these things completely out, but I'm about to go ahead and lift that out and inspect it right now. All right, guys, so here is the transmission pulled out. Um, I went ahead and just pulled it straight out. It's really easy to come out. I don't know if these separate or slip off, so just be careful of that. Um, but I did find the damage, and I'm going to go ahead and show you exactly what happened. So just like I said, a lot of times these shift forks bend, which are these right here. Um, this one doesn't necessarily look bend, but if you look at the side, the wear, can you see all the grinding down on here? Yeah, so that that's definitely and definitely going to be need, need to replace the... Uh, uh, the lower shift drum actually looks really good, so there's nothing wrong with that, so that's some money saved there. Uh, but here's what I want to show you when everybody talks about the dogs being bent up. So, again, this is a dog right here, and if you can look, can you see how that corner is rounded off compared to this end? Um, because it's basically spinning this way. You'll see where it's grabbed and slipped on this main gear here. I believe this is six. I don't know if this is six and this is second or second and sixth. Either way, they both need to be replaced. Um, give you a better idea, if I look in some of these gears here, you can see how sharp edged those dogs are on those. If you look in like right there, um, very sharp, not real sharp to cut you sharp, but very squared off um, where these basically are rounded. And what's happening is where this is supposed to go down and engage, it's basically popping out. When the torque really starts to go on the bike, it's snapping out and going like that. So um, this isn't a hard fix. The hardest part was getting to it. So now that we're really halfway done with this build, I mean, the whole top end's done. The bottom end's actually good. I don't need to replace the rod bearings. The crank looks fantastic. Um, it's all good news. Uh, the only thing we'll have to spend on is a couple gears, a shift fork, and some new gaskets. So I'm going to go ahead and order those. 
you won't know the difference and then we're going to start putting this thing back together all right guys and so moving forward the deepest part that we do have to remove again is the shift fork so we're going to go ahead and we're going to remove the side panel here uh, which has i believe five different hex nuts on it that we'll pull out um, pull that away and then we'll get this thing pulled out so let's go ahead and get those off all right so i was ready for the oil to come out uh, and it did so fortunately it all got caught in this rag right here uh, now what I think we have to do, I'm not 100% certain, I haven't done this part before. I'm pretty sure this pulls straight out, and then we have like a gear thing back here that also has to come out. And then I should be able to slide the shaft out, I think, if I have to take, I don't know if I have to take off those two bolts right there or what, but I'm going to go ahead and try it and see what happens. Alright guys, that was pretty easy. It pretty much just uh, slid right off. Uh, I took off the two little bolts and the retaining, uh, whatever that is, uh, bracket or whatever it is in the back here. Uh, and then basically discovered there's a small spring here inside it looks like the shaft that the fork tubes or the shift forks hold on to um, also to keep note too here i believe this is the shift drum here uh, so this right now is in its neutral position you can kind of see how the tip of that uh, that gear there is missing so when you put this thing back together you want to make sure to put it back in the same spot uh, you want to keep it neutral uh, also if you look from above here if you can kind of see in there your uh the back of your um or bottom i guess side of your uh shift fork which is it's kind of tough to see here a little nub sticking out there is sitting in a certain position in each one of those you want to make sure that goes back where it came from uh so what we're going to do right now we're going to pull out that little spring and we're going to slide this whole piece out i am going to compare the brand new yamaha part to the damaged part just to kind of get an idea of if it's just facial damage or if it's actually bent uh and then we're going to slide the uh, the new part on Put it all back together so uh, that, that'll be the rebuild process there let me go ahead and get that out all right another little note guys uh, i'm just using basically pliers to uh, sit down inside there and, and lightly slide it out but you'll notice there's another spring on the other side too you don't want to lose that you want to make sure to get a hold of that with your pliers while you're pushing it out maybe with a secondary set of pliers because uh, obviously you don't want that to fall in the case so uh, let's go ahead and move forward all right so that actually was really easy i was a little nervous at first but I just basically slid it out to right about there where I could barely see the, see the spring and I just kind of slid that fork out and slid the new one on and just slid it right back and it was super simple. Uh, but now I'm going to go ahead and do the reverse as typical. Uh, this is where the rebuild uh, process begins of putting everything back together. So all that's got to be timed back correctly the way it came out. Uh, that's going to get put back on. We are going to reseal the gasket here. Uh, then we'll keep moving forward. All right, guys, there you go. There is the uh, lid back on. Uh, with the new shift forked in and i even went ahead and put some uh, ultra black even though the uh the gasket was still good it wasn't really marred i put a little extra ultra black just to be safe uh, it's kind of like frank's red hot i put that shit on everything anyhow um quick uh quick preview of the bodywork what it's going to look like um you'll see that probably next episode here uh we gotta get the engine together uh, before we start messing with that, I didn't, uh, I won't get into much of it. I didn't do uh, a body work uh, episode this time, guys, just because you guys saw that in the R6. I didn't really need to go through that, but we will talk about the changes that we made on the bike. Anyhow, here are the uh, new parts. That is our six second gear. This is our six, or vice versa, again, whatever it is. These two ones right here, they got replaced. I got to figure out how to get this thing split real quick uh, and get those new pieces on. We'll also, we'll take a look at them side by side to show you the differences. All right, guys, so I got it. Uh, just a word of advice. The left-hand side of it from over here falls off the first couple of gears, so be careful. I, was, I thought I was going to struggle with it getting it apart. I thought maybe I'd have to press it apart. No, you don't have to do that, but the first couple come right off, so be careful. Uh, the rest of them are held on by, like, spined washers and some retaining clips or C-clips, uh, which will use, you'll use a reverse, uh, basically reverse uh, retaining clip holder remover to take it off. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the gears themselves. So again, this being the new gear, this being the old one, um, it's kind of tough to see, I guess, from this angle. Let's see if I can look at it like that. Uh, still kind of hard to really see. Um, nonetheless, these are definitely rounded more. Um, maybe that'll show a little bit better now. Um, just enough, again, where, where they're slipping out of this, and then you can see the difference between this gear and that gear. Uh, without the wear it's kind of obvious there just enough that uh, it's slipping out so now it's time for reversal uh, make sure when you take these things off I was flipping them upside down and setting them one at a time so I wasn't losing count or losing order if for some reason you screw up and lose order don't worry you can get on any Yamaha parts site 
look up the transmission parts and it'll show you a guide on the installation for all of them if you don't have the manual. So let's go ahead and slide this thing back together. All right guys, so it's, it's in now. Uh, there's the old ones in with the new ones. Um, definitely to confirm, uh, order is super important. Don't mess it up. Um, also a little note, uh, it's gonna be kind of hard to see, but right here, there is, if you can kind of see the lips right there, there's, there, there's a, a, a kind of a slip spring, there's two, like a, one of those tooth gears, or not gears, but uh, the sp spline washers. Uh, there's two different ones. One has a, a female prong, one has a male prong that sits inside it. You can kind of see it if you look hard enough there. Um, the difficult thing is, there are notches where, where, where those basically sit in to stop these things from sliding. You've got to slide the uh, female one up so it's able to spin around in circles to get the male to clip into it. Uh, that locks together. It's going to take you a second to figure that out. I can't really better explain that. Uh, but you got to get the lower one set, the, the, the female one set in the splined uh, cutout area um, before you slide the uh, male one over top of it. Like I said, it will not work. You'll be wondering, thinking you have to bend the, uh, the teeth to get it back, but you don't. You just have to get that just right. Um, anyhow, uh, hopefully that you'll figure that out. It's, I know it's kind of difficult. It sounds difficult, and it was, but I figured it out. It took a minute. Anyhow, um, there it is in. So now it's going to be start time. It's going to be time to start putting together the case and everything. So well, let's go ahead and I guess reverse order and start putting things together. All right. So now it's time to put on the lower case. Uh, the manual does show you where all these bolts go to, but again, I I, ne I just kind of kept mine is not is not tilted too far to keep all the bolts in place as possible. Uh, clean the bottom of it. Clean the bottom of this here with carb cleaner. And now I'm going to go ahead and put some ultra black all along the seams. Uh, we're going to fit this thing back top you know, down to it and uh, clamp it down. All right, guys, so there's a uh, thin layer of the uh, Ultra Black. Uh, now, I read online somewhere, or I saw online in a video, somebody said these two halves were glued together. I don't know if that was just a term they used or not. I didn't see anything about it in the manual. That's probably because I didn't read the manual. So, uh, you use Ultra Black at your uh, your own discretion, I guess. Uh, just uh, be warned, I assume it's gonna work. I've used it on cases before, so that's what I'm using. Um, anyhow, uh, this is about to go back on top of it. We are going to bolt down all our bolts in sequence that they are supposed to be per the manual. Uh, and I believe the right specs, if I can get those, they should be in there. Uh, so let's go ahead and move forward before the stuff dries. All right, guys, moving forward. Those are all back in. Uh, and FYI, uh, they are all numbered, too. All the main ones for the core, at least, on the uh, right uh, numbers you want to get down. So if you look at these here, you'll see there's a one there, two there. And you got four and five, so the, everything's pretty much labeled through the main core of the block to which you need to go in order uh, as it's shown. Uh, and again, use the right uh, torque measurements because you want to make sure those bolts don't come loose, especially inside the engine. So let's go ahead and move forward. All right, guys, so the oil pump is back in. Um, hopefully, if you don't remember how to put it back in, you can watch the videos in reverse to help you kind of get an idea of how they go back together. But it's really easy. You take your pump assembly, you slide the turbo-looking... Uh, intake almost thing into the side right here. You should feel this part kind of fit itself into place. You are going to have a, a long bolt, which is tough to see, um, holding in right here, oh, right here. You have uh, these two bolts holding this piece in here, two bolts holding in your screen pickup. And now what we need to do is we need to put on the gear and chain that we removed in uh, the past video. So, uh, also, we had to use new gaskets because, well, not using new gaskets is really stupid to go through all this work and let an old piece of junk like that basically ruin your day. So, let's go ahead and get some more of this stuff on. All right now, guys, so putting back on this gear and chain is not rocket science. Keep in mind, in the center of this chain, it's got two, or I'm sorry, the sprocket, it's got two flat sides. You'll have to get it with your finger pushed against it and keep turning the lower gear until it fits itself in place. You'll know when it does. Then, and only then, you're gonna take that little nut right there, the 10 millimeter nut, which is not gonna be in it while you're doing that. Uh, stick it in the end of a ratcheting 10 millimeter. Uh, be very careful, because you don't wanna drop it in there. Bring it sideways, set it in, and then what I do, is I go ahead and take another socket right behind it, just like that, if you can see. And I go ahead and ratchet it all the way in so that bolt can't fall anywhere. So let me go ahead and tighten that down. Also, another little tip, guys, uh, once you get into the point where it's uh, got some resistance, the whole thing's going to spin, I go ahead and take, again, needle-nose pliers, 
uh, just enough to lock it underneath the tooth here so it cannot spin anymore. Uh, I finished tightening it down. You don't have to crank on it. It's fairly easy. You got to put a little bit of pressure to make sure that nuts or that bolt's not going to come loose. Uh, but this just enough to hold on to it to where it can't spin any farther. All right. So once you got that thing tightened down there, do not forget to put the, your chain guard on because uh, one of the bolts is actually a bolt that's the longer bolt that secures uh, the pump down to the uh, main block itself. So now that that's on. We're cutting it down to the very basics. We got to start getting our new gaskets on, which means we have to clean that face and that face uh, of the base, I should say, or of the oil pan. Uh, we'll get this old bitter, brittle gasket off here, get the new one on. Uh, then all these bolts again will hold that on. Don't forget as well, I still have to put this down into the pump, which will lead up to our oil system. So let's go ahead and move forward and get that on. All right, so both gasket surfaces are clean now. Uh, don't forget that one little guy that fell inside the engine earlier, if for some reason yours fell out, make sure you put both of them back in. This is what's gonna hold your brand new gasket into place. And now we are gonna take the lower, uh, the oil pan, we are gonna set it right where it goes and we're gonna put on all our screws right here with the right torque and the right order. Let's move forward. All right guys, there we go. It's all on and torqued down. We are good to go. In case you're wondering, or that little tiny bracket right there goes, that's where it goes to hold the uh, oil, I think it's an oil pickup sensor or something. Um, so that's where it goes. Anyhow, we got plenty of other goodies and our gaskets to put on. Um, don't forget, we got to put the stator back on, we got to put the clutch back in, um, and plenty of other things. So let's go ahead and move forward. Well, since the side's out, let's go get the uh, stator side on. All right, so the stator's in. This part's fairly easy, guys. First step you want to do is you want to get your uh, seal for your wiring put in. And then your wire is going to run back behind this loop down here. Once you do that, you'll figure out exactly which bolt hole is going which. It'll line itself basically up. Plus, they are slightly offset, so it's kind of hard to mess them up. Um, also, too, if you're looking at your stator and it looks like it's got rust or corrosion on the outsides, either take a wire brush or a very fine wire brush wheel like this with a drill, very carefully not to eat up the outside green, and clean it up. Then you want to wipe it off, and you can even put a layer of oil around that if you'd like. Um, because oil is going to be entering this housing as well. So now it is time to put on the cover. And with the cover, we also need to add the magneto. So magneto go on, main bolt goes on that. Uh, and then as a cover, actually this cover we don't have to replace because, well, it's, uh, it's just brand new on the rebuild. So whoever rebuilt it last time. So let's go ahead and get those on. All right, guys. So next step is we want to seal our uh, wiring. So you're going to take some ultra black. You're going to wipe it around the center right here. Like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not even focusing. We're going to wipe it around the center right there. And then along the insides right here to get a good seal. Uh, then once we're done, we're going to apply a little bit of bead right over top of this here. Uh, and then we're going to move forward. Okay, so now it's time to put on our rotor or magneto. Uh, what you'll notice about this is it actually looks like the typical rotor magneto where you have a keyway. Unfortunately, with this particular model, there's no keyway on the crankshaft. Uh, so this must be a universal piece they use for multiple bikes. Um, but this is really simple. Um, you'll see the force it pulls on with a magnet when you put it on. It sucks itself right on. Uh, then you have your nut and bolt. Now these are not supposed to be reused. These are supposed to be a one-time use. Uh, the manufacturer, manufacturer suggests that you replace these after you remove them. Uh, and basically what you're going to do is you're going to take the new one. You're going to twist it in here. Tighten it all the way down with 47, uh, I believe it's inch pounds uh, of torque. And then you're going to turn it another 60 degrees. So basically roughly um, a, a third of a turn, a third of a revolution. Or I guess that would be a little bit more than that. Anyhow, um, but a 60 degree turn uh, after it's tightened just to give it a kind of that crank. Do not do it more, do not do it less. So let's go ahead and do that and then we're going to put our cover on. All right guys, so I went ahead and spun the engine around and set it up to install our clutch and basket. So we're gonna go ahead and do the reverse order as we took it off and get that put together real quick. All right guys, so now with the clutch basket assembly installed, we're gonna wanna go ahead and make sure that we get this thing, uh, basically with the gears or the teeth that you see facing towards the rear of the motor, uh, like so. And then what happens is that actuates inside this pull lever here. So we have to go ahead and set our lever accordingly, like so. So when we slide it on, there will be tension on that, and then the gears inside there will grab the gear teeth on there. So let's go ahead and get that installed. All right, so clutch cover is installed. Now we have one more cover to install here, uh, and then I have a pipe that still needs to be installed back over here. 
Uh, and then I gotta get the oil filter on it. We need to fill this thing full of oil and then we need to turn it over to make sure it's clear. Following that procedure, we're gonna go ahead and clean the carb throttle bodies. Uh, and then this thing's gonna get ready to get put back in. All right, guys, I went ahead and threw on a light satin black uh, coat of paint to go with our uh, entire theme. Uh, and then I'm gonna go ahead and throw in our brand new laser iridium plugs and our coil packs and get this thing ready to be installed. Anyhow, that makes this video wrap. Guys, stick around for the newest upcoming video, which will be getting this thing put in and the rest of the bike put together. Look forward to seeing you there. Throw a thumbs up. Hope you're subscribed. If not, hit that button. See you soon.